first uh, since since on, on, yeah, the three. three. Perfect.
fingers, really fast bow, and uh, dare say you hit every note. Congratulations on that. Good for you. But besides that, you also have a very good sense of what, what you want to do with music. I can hear um, your phrasing. And so I wanted to ask you a question. First of all, those of you who um, might know the entire concerto might no notice uh, the things we're talking about here. But what I wanted to ask you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, if there's ever a question I ask you that you don't really know the answer, it's okay if you don't, can't think of an answer. It's totally okay. Actually, before I ask you a question, do you have any questions for me? Um, I mean, I'm assuming you've had a really experience with this piece. Do you have, like, I guess, like, a meaning that you attach it to? Because that was something that I was, like, kind of struggling, I think, to find, is, like, oh. if there's, like, a scene that you can share. Because I feel like in different parts, I have, like, different ideas or different visions for what I... Well, like, tell me about what you have in mind. I guess, like, the slow part, uh, where it kind of, like, the part that ends up getting all of our minds. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which was kind of, like, way, very kicking nice. off into space, or, like, very peaceful, like, I don't know, walking among the stars or something like mm -hmm. that. But I was wondering, like, in general, like, for this piece, you have, like, a kind of vision or, like, a story. You know, I'm so glad that that's the first question you asked, because that was about to be the question I was going to ask you, and <laughs> you kind of already answered it. Um, but in terms of what I see in it, uh, think of it, I just put this out for your suggestion, because for your uh, consideration. Because obviously Sanson didn't have a program that he wrote for it the way that, like Strauss did for Zarathustra or other um, tone poems. But we can always use our imagination and uh, have imagery. So if you know the, the first movement starts with this bang and then right away you're playing all these triplets and really fast and it's almost like breakneck until you finally get the second theme. And then you kind of do a lot of that and then you finally get a little breather in the second movement. I think of this almost as like a, I don't know if you've ever heard the, uh, the term, it's kind of a literary term, the hero's journey. Think of Star Wars with the, the New Hope, Luke Skywalker, right? Um, you start with your protagonist who's in his ordinary thing, but then something bang, something happens, he has to answer the call to action. This kind of starts with the bang, the call to action, where he has to, you know, uh, decide whether he wants to go for the adventure or not, he decides to go. And from then, everything goes. Um, but in the second movement, so I'm, I'm thinking of it as you have an inciting incident. The first movement is where you take the challenge and you, you go for the challenge. There's a lot of struggle with the, the harmony because the, there's some dissonant moments that you have to resolve and then technical moments that you have to conquer, which, you know, which you're doing beautifully. The second movement is kind of a little bit of a respite because you need a little bit of a break to actually imagine yourself sitting in, you know, contemplating your next move. Like in this case, Princess Leah, he's, Luke is thinking about who is this beautiful person who he didn't know was his sister, but. <laughs> but anyway, he's enamored with this beautiful person, and so he's daydreaming about her, or looking into the stars and imagining what his life would be off of the planet uh, that he grew up on. So I think of that very placid second movement as the more contemplative thing. But then, as you get to the end of that, he's reminded of what he's doing here in the first place. And that's when you hear the end of the first movement kind of starts with the beginning of the third movement where you hear that first theme come again in the oboe, right? Yeah. Uh, it's almost a hint because that's not, that's the first movement, but he's reminded of the first movement. And then boom, you start with da 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 You start that whole third movement and now you're actually in that battle. Um, so, if you think of the hero's journey, he has the call to adventure, he answers the call, he takes a break uh, to, to, after fighting some battles, and then he, maybe uh, from that point on, he goes on to win and conquer the whole thing. So, think of this whole concerto like the hero's journey. Uh, I'm not doing a great job explaining that, but if you just Google hero's journey, you'll, you'll, you'll see what, what I mean by that. It's almost in every single uh, movie or, or novel uh, even with uh, Avatar. But um, you can see what a geek <laughs> analogies I use. So, yeah, um, do you have any other questions before I move on? Um, I guess not. Okay, that's perfect. First, I want to tell you some of the things I really, really liked about uh, how you played this movement. Um, so, you'll notice that when this movement starts, um, it's kind of that letter K, the actual theme. Um, each one of those is almost like kind of a sigh, right? Um, 
this is after we do that recap at letter right. J, right? Yeah. Um, and so these are all hanging around that um, kind of the, the E, F, E, F, because you'll notice this, that's the dominant of, of A minor, yeah. right? Um, could you, could we play that together? I would have you play that for us, like right at uh, letter, before letter K, one, two, three, four, five, maybe the two T, the seven bars before it comes in. So that's before letter K, one, two, three, four, five, so the 12 or 13 before. Do you have a yeah, yeah, I think we have the same. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that would be if you can leave them in with the seven measures before you come in. Oh, okay. Lengthen them just a little bit, 
it, it, it gives a, a more of a, of a shape and weight. Otherwise, it's more like, um, like just like a, a long two by four with just one shape, one straight across. You want to give some parts of it a little bit of a dip, a little bit more weight, and then come back up. If you think about the way a roller coaster goes, yeah. it goes up. And as you get to the top, it slows down a bit, right? And just as you get to the top, and then it starts to creep to the bottom, and as it starts to climb up, it slows down again. So there's a lot of that type of momentum that happens in music, mm -hmm. where you will maybe slow down and broaden and get bigger, like that, that last Ramada, da -di -di -da. that's where we climbing up to the top. But with this, this, if you look at the shape, it's almost like a roller coaster. Da -di -da -da -di -da -da. And you start winding up right. Okay, so all that to say, just give a little bit of shape on certain notes like that C. Yeah. And you notice you're doing this phrase two times, right? Mm -hmm. The second time it happens, it's actually a different dynamic. Well, mm -hmm. oh, we're not even getting that far yet. But dee da 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 I would start the phrase again there. So at the top of that phrase, we go da 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 di, da, the B to the E. Finish that phrase nicely. Don't, don't think of it like I have to go into beat three and four right away. Right. Finish beat three, finish that phrase, and then take a breath and start again. Don't be afraid to take a little bit of time to take a breath and then start the phrase again. Um, your wonderful pianist will, will know what you're doing. He'll wait for you as you do it again. So let's try that, that uh, letter K again.
Um, and I, I do hate to stop you there. But what I would like you to consider, remember, you did definitely play the pianissimo slightly different this time, but don't feel that you have to start right on time. Because while he's playing, da -dee -da -da, da -dee -da -da. it's almost like being suspended. And if you just come right at perfectly in time, there's no, there's no sense of suspense. So let it hang in the air a little bit. But how long should you wait? That's the question. How would you decide that? That's what feels right. Right. Well, that, and but one way to make it feel right is take a breath. Where are you going? Keep going. It actually gives it gives the conductor or uh, your other musician partners your visual cue and audible cue, but it's also in the right tempo of, of uh, the, the space that you need. So can you go right there at that two uh, B four K? No, no, not two B four K. It's you know where he's holding the long E, and, and then take a deep breath. You know, I mean naturally, but take a, a breath before you start it. Don't don't, don't feel like you're being right on time. It's almost like you're doing a micro fermata at the end of that evening. Well in tune too. 
What can help you is that if you're, if you're playing these and you're starting to feel rushed by it, use more bow. Because by using more bow, you give yourself the mental illusion that you have more space and that the notes have more time to be, because if you only use a small amount of bow for each, like uh, four sixteenths, then you, you intuitively know that, okay, you only have this much bow for that, you know, this much bow for that. Right. But if, you, if you're using that much bow, it's like you have all this time to play each note. Right. And so it will help you, prevent you from rushing. What makes our fingers want to rush is that we're running out of bow. So you can practice it like very slowly. Can you just play just the, the first part of that run, but like almost half time to play, you just like twice as much bow for everything. And, and show me what that looks like for you. Should I use it the same bow that I do? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. But just, just use more, a lot more bow for each one of them.
then when you finally hit that low C, is it low C? Right before that long scale, yeah. Just really let it ring because this is like the most glorious moment of that whole thing. Um, are we at time now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, so in general, I'll just make a few quick uh, notes for you. Um, take time at tops of phrases like da, 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 da. don't just like hit it and just go, you know. Yeah. Find places to be. In romantic music, you have time to stretch. Yeah. Anytime you stretch the and lengthen the, the, the uh, phrase or the notes, you, you, you can give it back with more of the shallow rondo later. But it has to be elastic. It, it can't just be static. You know, so if it's like a rubber band that doesn't budge, then it's not really like romantic music. It should stretch and it snap back, stretch, and basically. But bravo, very well done. And um, if you have any other questions, you can be in touch. You have my email. Yeah. Just, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much.
this is, you know, I, I like to joke about it, but this is really a, a sonata for piano and cello. <laughs> when you think about it, because it's like the, it's like the piano concerto, the second piano concerto. Um, so, you know, I apologize, dear pianist, if I don't spend enough time working with you on this uh, in terms of chamber music, but um, I will try my best to, you know, make this a very balanced thing. Ensemble-wise, quite good. Um, I actually, okay, let's start with you. Do you have questions for me that you want to focus on? Um, at one point, um, I think that this piece I think I'm like putting too much attention in my hands. Mm. And so there are moments where I was almost like busy. Oh, oh because it's was, like so you were yeah. feeling like you were losing the grip or something. Yeah, that was the first time. Ah, okay. Well, um, I did notice something I think that might help a little bit. Um, it seems to me that you naturally uh, favor the lower half of the bow. Mm -hmm. And like when you need more sound, you we all do, we play the lower half a lot because that's where the, the natural weight of the arm is and it's strongest there with the least amount of effort. I think you might be getting fatigued as you get up to the upper half because um, there's a certain balance that, that you um, that are, seem to be lacking. So the balance comes from uh, when you're holding the bow, we pronate a little bit more towards the first finger as we get out to the tip. Um, and if you can maintain that, I'm going to grab my chin up because uh, sometimes it's easier to demonstrate. But if you can maintain more of that uh, grip at the tip, just by balancing, not so much by squeezing here, but by angling your elbow a little bit higher and then leaning that weight into your first finger. Can you try playing just a, a few open string notes at, at the, on the D string at, near the tip? And just back and forth at the tip like a Uh, 
uh, the beginning of a, a bow stroke exercise that um, I learned from a couple of teachers, but I once, I was lucky enough when I was a high school student, had a chance to take a lesson with Yo-Yo Ma. And of the three things I really remember him saying, he was trying to show me a bow stroke that, uh, that helped with even sound production. And this bow stroke is called Martelet. And Martelet um, is basically where you have a very fast bow, but you start with a very clean start. Like Try to make the tip sound just like the frog. So it doesn't have to sound pretty, it just has to sound resonant. Can you just try that? That's it.
Now, at that section here, where you're playing, um, I can see that this is the part that most cellists kind of either love or hate. Um, the, the problem I'm hearing there is that um, you're focusing a lot on the left hand, I think, because you want it to be in tune, of course, but really what's going to save you is the bow, because the bow is what makes all the sound. I hear um, you're, you're playing all right with the left hand, so you don't have to worry about it, but if you're only playing like... As I was telling Henry, um, free yourself up. Free up your left hand, free up your whole body. Back. I would practice it very slowly. Like
And, but I want to encourage you to practice things as close to the bridge as you possibly can. What's naturally going to happen is that you're going to say, oh, that's too scratchy, and you're going to try to make it sound better while you stay there. And then as you develop that, you're going to find a whole world of sound production right here closer to the bridge where it takes a lot less effort, actually, and you get a much more solid projecting sound. Um, and that will uh, translate into when you're playing loud passages, like in this piece with the giant piano things, you have to be able to project, but you can't project by um, just by pressure. It has to be, you have to use the sounding point and the bow speed and placement properly. Okay, well, getting into the music now. Um, let me ask you, what is your favorite moment in this piece? Ooh. Do you both have different favorite moments, Cindy? Um, or one of your favorite moments? The triplets are kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm always kind of happy to get to the end. I love that part too. Yeah. You know, um, not right now because it's hard to do things on the spot, but did you ever think about maybe reversing the bow on that? Because the reason why I like to do it that way, um, Shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, <laughs> 
I just kind of like, it has to be going somewhere. And this whole thing goes pretty much until, until you get to the recap the, of the Temple One. But one of the landing spots is, oh my God. <laughs> when you get to that big uh, A7 chord, um, you do get a little bit of breath to start winding up again. You notice I took a big long da 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 dee da 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 you know, I gave myself some time to really do that uh, on the first one, but then I started the cello rondo. So there is one place where I did stop and smell the rose for a little bit, but I got right back on the train and, and, and the train was still moving at, at, at a fast pace. So you want to keep that, because what it says here is poco a poco, a cello rondo, a crescendo al tempo one. From that point on, you're going all the way until that recap, that big uh, resolution. So, uh, can you guys try that together now?
have uh, Beethoven, third time.
sense that you guys rehearsed it, probably talked about certain things that you wanted to do to make it really special, so that came through very well. Um, do you have any questions for me? Maybe the beginning? Yeah, okay. That's usually... So, just to put you at ease with it, we used to have a song that we were saying about it, and it would go like, How I hate to play this stupid sonata because I start alone. Because you start alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, we used to uh, joke about that, but there's some, some truth to it because, you know, it's kind of scary to start a piece um, all alone. Uh, that's one reason why playing on a company Bach is very challenging. But here the, the, the thing is that, you know, you're not the only person, everybody I've known, even famous people, somehow don't land on the E exactly in tune with the piano. <laughs> so don't worry if you've noticed that. I've even heard recordings where, you know, the, you know people, they just can't quite get the, it sounds in tune to the cello, but when, as soon as the piano comes in, it's like, oh, we have to adjust it a little bit. So don't let that throw you. It happens in live performances. I've even heard it in, in um, recordings. As for the opening, I would say that there's two different ways I've heard them do the first two notes. You can do the slide, which is very traditional, or something. I've heard Yo-Yo Ma do a string crossing. And so that, in some ways, is harder for the left hand, but easier uh, to manage so that you don't hear it. So you can try it either way. Um, what kind of uh, questions do you have about the opening? Mainly, I guess, vibrato. Vibrato, okay. So, should I think vibrato maybe a note? I would say, in this very opening, you, you don't want to use too much vibrato because it's not really an uh, intense moment. You also don't want to play like a uh, period instrument, like, you know, Renaissance, no vibrato at all. Somewhere in between. Um, so just enough to. You know, you don't want to be like Russian, Russian folk. Not like that, but um, just a little bit like that whole thing. Just a little, just a little bit of a shape. But you know what will help? I I, I noticed um, that there is a little bit of tension. I think I, I can see that you want to use vibrato, but then something makes you kind of back away from using that. It's not the left hand, it's the bow. Um, you tend to play closer to the fingerboard, and that's wonderful in a lot of places, but you look what happens if you go higher on the string, right? Now the string length is half here. It would stand to reason that your sounding point, remember we were talking about sounding point? It has to adjust it as well, because if you play something here, and then here, it starts to sound thinner and thinner. You have to adjust where you place the bow to get the same quality of sound. This, and then this one. You notice the difference? So as you play higher up on the string, play a little bit closer to the bridge. Initially, that's scary because you're not used to it, and it's counterintuitive because you think, oh, everything I play is going to sound even more. But actually, once you start to find that core, um, vibrato is much easier. find it's too scratchy, then a little bit closer to the fingerboard. If it's too fuzzy, a little bit closer to the bridge. Yeah, so, you know, the, the overall sound, I, I, I think you found more before. What we're always doing is trying to look for the core. Um, Whether we're playing really loud or even quietly, 
Yeah, so for the opening, I would definitely experiment with bow placement, try different parts of the bow, and purposely try to find a different color. If it, you know, try something that's too bright, or something too solid, and then try something that's too dark and too, too um, airy, and then everything in between. Once you can do those purposely, then when you will adjust in your ear on the spot, like, you know, you'll know how to adjust. But if you just play and practice and come what may, then you might go through the, run the whole gamut of colors on it, but you wouldn't know that you did it. So the idea is that you have the experience of purposely using those colors so that you can adjust on the fly. And if something doesn't sound right to you, you know what to do because you've already practiced it. Now, question I have for you, for you guys both, because you know, this is an equal, just like the Rachmaninoff, this is an equal pairing. You know, Rachmaninoff, uh, Beethoven, they were both virtuoso pianists as well as composers. So when they wrote for the piano, you know, they, they didn't just write them, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> they wrote real parts that they themselves would play. So um, uh, as a piece of chamber music, I'd like to ask you guys, what, what is your, when you think of Beethoven, what, what, how would you characterize his music? Or, you know, you can't, I'm not trying to say, give me the one answer, but just what are some things you think about when you, the characters of Beethoven's music? Very dramatic. Dramatic, yes, that's a good word. Anything else? Mm -hmm. It's never like, you know, like light and Mozart type of phrase. It's always something very profound. Um, one of the things that this reminds me of is like his fifth symphony. And one of the things in the fifth symphony is he's got lots of like rude interruptions and, and sudden bursts, outbursts. And when you think about the type of person Beethoven was, that was kind of the way he was. He, did, he didn't really, wasn't a very polite man. He was just like, he felt that he would just say he didn't care. And so he does a lot of that here in the sonata. Not in the opening, because the opening just seems very calm. And like that. But look what happens after the uh, ad libitum that the cello plays. And you're expecting something pleasant, right? But no, you go boom! And not only does he do something suddenly in forte, but he's, he, he's playing it in a different key. I thought this was a sonata in A major. But this first theme here comes out in A minor? What's going on with that? That's him being, you know, the, the surprise of Beethoven. So, what the, within that, what do you see here as a pattern in like measures 25, 26? Uh, any specific markings that you see repeated? Sforzandos. Okay, let me ask you guys. Did you guys talk about like, uh, what does Sforzandos mean and how you're going to do them? Okay, good. No, that's all right. You know, I'm not trying to set you up for like you know, trap you or anything like that. But these are really good questions. When Beethoven puts three sports on in a row, he doesn't mean like, yeah, that's a suggestion. I mean, he probably would have like yelled at somebody if he didn't do it. But sports on I think they're, they're meant to like just jump out of So da 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 these are dramatic sports items. They require a little bit of time uh, and weight on them. And how that can be achieved, my little cheat sheet for that is that the note before the sports items play a little bit shorter. So, um, da, ba, -de 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 so um, can you guys start right there? On, uh, actually, let's get into that. Uh, if you can do measure 20. Uh,
now you guys are ready to spoil everybody. You know, we're trying to try to make it like they never heard this the next part. <laughs> Thank you. 
better too when you do that. Because um, when you when you're not skimming the surface so much, uh, and you're more into the core of the stream, and every little shape you do is, is more effective, more efficient. Um, so when you get to the end here, um, before he starts to take over the eighth notes of the year, da 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 section in a sense of closure and the next section in a sense of opening. So finish that back state and start again. And you, 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 can, you can do that by taking a breath right before you start again. Alright, so how about we go back to uh, measure 38? Because you notice you guys are basically switching parts. First the cello plays the, the scale going up while the piano plays the melody and then you switch places. So when, before you switch, take a breath. Some of that. 
So prior to that fortissimo at 77, you guys are at forte. I would recommend saving, reserve some of that sound and really give it at 77. And the other way you set up that fortissimo is with time. Dee da, dee da, right? And then back into tempo. Slow down just a little bit before the fortissimo and then hit the fortissimo right back to tempo. Okay, can we go back to where the cello has that theme? Um, um, <laughs> Actually, the last dynamic marking I saw before that 
the dispersivo, I mean, it goes way back to like the second mm -hmm. end, right? So that's kind of, the last line I've been working is piano dolce. So this whole section has been kind of piano, has a little swell like in 101, 110, uh, 11, and 12, but it comes back down. And then 113, where you have that's all within piano. So you have a little swell in piano, but it really has to come down even less than piano. And then why? Because then you have this fortissimo, another one of Beethoven's rude punch in the face when you're not expecting it, right? So you achieve that with two things, sound and what's the second thing? Uh, time. Time, sound and time. So give it a little bit of time as you do the diminuendo. If you don't give them enough time and go right into it, they don't have a chance to get surprised. All right, let's just uh, do, if we can just do that and we'll, actually no, um, we'll, I'd like to just maybe, I think I have to finish now, uh, but I'd like to give you a chance to just play the very ending for the last couple of minutes we have. So let's take it from that coda uh, because we have, Right, let's go from measure 247 to the end, just like the last 30 seconds of the piece of the movement. Uh, actually, yeah, 248 actually. Let's do from there. <laughs> Thank you very much for all, uh, for all your time here.